had from Liverpool, who became one of the greatest songwriters of all time as a member of the Beatles. Today, would you believe, would have been John Lennon's 80th, 80th. birthday. Wow. In just a moment, we're going to be uh, reflecting on his remarkable life with his sister, Julia. But first of all, let's take a look back at how he became a global icon. We can now talk to Julia Baird. Julia is John Lennon's sister. Julia, good morning to you. Good morning, and thank you for having us on. Not at all. It's, it's good to talk to you, Julia. Um, so today would have been your brother's 80th birthday. Um, do you normally mark his birthday? Are you doing anything special to mark his birthday today? Well, no, I don't normally mark anything like this publicly. Um, I, I never have before. But this is a particular birthday, well, 80. Well, it's really old, isn't it? Um, and having a brother of 80 is uh, quite uh, special. But um, it's because I'm involved with Strawberry Field that I am. We are actually going out for a meal later, which is what we normally do. Yeah, tell people about Strawberry Field, because this is a community uh, project that you're very, very involved with. Um, and, yes. And it's very close, or was very close to John's heart as well. Absolutely. Um, the song Strawberry Field that you all know, uh, John wrote when they were having a bit of a gap, and he was being reflective about his life. He later called it my only psychoanalytic poem. And I see John as a poet, very much so. Uh, so, and he said it was his favourite song. So that's a lovely thing to hear. But Strawberry Field is a very special place for John, a sanctuary. There's no doubt about that at all. Well, um, you, we and now it's reopened. It's reopened. Yeah, you wish you're his younger sister. We should point out there's what a seven-year, <laughs> <laughs> seven-year <laughs> uh, age. The screen isn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, what what was it like being John Lennon's sister? Well, I don't know. If you have a sister, I can only say to you, you know, what's it like being Rosemary's sister or something, brother, because we didn't know any differently. You know, John was our brother. There's, that's me in the middle looking sort of a bit gurney. And there's uh, John to my right and our cousins. We were always together. Uh, it was a very, very close-knit family for the youngsters. We're the, the cousins. As, so, you, as you all grew up, how did you deal with his fame? Could you spot that there was something different about this guy? No, because everybody who had a brother, that brother was in a group, not a band. The band had jellos and things. Uh, it was in a group. But they all gradually dropped off as they got to 15 and the parents pulled them out. Colin Hampton, the drummer, became a joiner. Rod Davis um, went to Cambridge to study languages. Um, you know, they all want to do their different things, but John and Paul had a determination that the others didn't have, and they went off to Hamburg, and that turned everything around for them. And did you get to, to hang out with them, Julia? You know, when they were songwriting, when the band was playing, rehearsing, were you allowed to kind of just hang out? Well, in, the, in our kitchen in Springwood in Liverpool, that's where my mother not only encouraged it and said you can have the kitchen to rehearse, uh, she joined in. She played the washboard and she played the banjo herself. So she was joining in. Colin Hansen's mother allowed them to practice, but only when she was out of the house. <laughs> My mother wanted to be in the in the group herself, I think. <laughs> well, you said your mother was was quite musical herself. Is she was indeed, yeah. yeah. Tell us And John had it from his other his paternal grandfather as well. Yeah. Tell us about John. What was he like? Um, he was just, uh, he's six and a half years older than me and nine years older than our younger sister, Jackie. So very much the older brother, bit bossy. Um, very, played with us a lot, drew with us, um, you know, practised on timetables with us, all that sort of thing that you would expect of an older brother. Took us to the cinema, took us to the pictures, we called it, mm -hmm. to see Elvis. Um, we would sit through Elvis and then the, the, the little picture and then Elvis again. Uh, we'd sit through the whole thing twice. You talk about the pictures there. Um, you went to the premiere of It's a Hard Day's Night, didn't you? And didn't John did. come out looking... Didn't he look for you in the audience the first thing he did? That, yeah, that was really lovely, yes. Um, the real, the official premiere, of course, was in London with Princess Margaret. And we'd wanted to go to that. And said, mm, we want to come, we want to come. He said, no, no, no. He said, we've got to do this because it's royalty and stuff. He said, but the real premiere is actually the next day 
in Liverpool in 1964. They closed the city down. Um, the whole family went to that. And we sat with the mayor of Liverpool and his family and all the dignitaries and stuff and got chocolates and all that nice stuff. And just before it started, John came out from the curtains, you know, on the big theatre and shouted, where's my family? He was like this because of the lights. Where's my family? I've gone I've lost my family. And we all sort of stood up and said, we're here, John, we're here. It's all right, we're here. All right. And he disappeared and it all went quiet before it started. <laughs> so he, he, we'd lost each other in the, in the melee. Did you lose each other through fame? I, I, I don't know what it was like because yeah. there was so, mm. seldom... I mean, there, there, there was hardly anybody more famous than the Beatles mm. on planet mm. Earth. What was that like to deal with? Well, it was a gradual thing for us, and we didn't lose John until he went to America. Um, and that, it's not only us that lost him then, that everybody lost him physically. Uh, but the same thing happened at the end of 1973. John comes back, and he's, he's going, my family, where's my family? And we're saying, we're all here, John, we're all here. We haven't moved anywhere. And we started getting letters and phone calls and until he died, we were in touch. And, of course, he was coming home. We all know that. So um, uh, exactly the same thing happened again. He was looking for his family again. Yeah. Mm. The Beatles were his family for a long while as well. Do you think, yes, they were. Do you think they ever would have got back together again, Julia? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. Will Julian and Sean step in? I don't know. Uh, or Danny, um, I really, uh, we'd be, it's all supposition, isn't it? It's all supposition. I see John as an artist. I think he'd be writing and painting. And I've been joking that right now he might be busking in the rain outside the closed pattern club to make a point. And what about you, Julia, personally? We all love the music and listening to the music and the incredible words that he wrote. Can you listen to it? Is it? How difficult is it for you to listen to the music or is it a comfort to listen to it all was, that wonderful music he left behind? It was terrible at first. None of the family could listen to anything. And even now, if an interview comes on, um, it's likely now, and I hear his voice, it's like, oh, it's a dog. It really is. And I actually watched Above Us Only Sky for the first time ever last weekend cards of the piano at Strawberry Field um, and I watched it and it was quite hard but by the end I was I was enjoying it it's a it's a weird thing because it's a bit of John's presence it's almost feels uh, that film almost felt personal yeah. but Strawberry Field is I mean the honorary president for Strawberry Field and the piano that John composed and recorded Imagine On the upright Steinway he bought in 1970, there we are, thank you, is now installed very happily in the exhibition in Strawberry Field. And anyone coming to see it will be supporting the programme that's going on downstairs, which is a work training programme. The Salvation Army has reopened Strawberry Field uh, as a training centre for youngsters with mild to moderate learning disabilities, age 18, up to 25 and possibly a bit older. You know, they were fallen, not, not even fallen off the tracks, maybe they were never yeah. sort of fully on the tracks. They've come through the that, school that's, system. That's part of his legacy. If you were to encapsulate it, what do you think his legacy is? Well, peace, all the things we're still talking about today, peace, equality, diversity, that word wasn't in use then, but that's what John was talking about. On that same piano, George Michael later um, composed and recorded Patience uh, for 7-7, for 9-11. Uh, so the piano itself is, has become a symbol of peace. But um, John, a peacemaker, a, a peacemaker, and I'm sure he still would have been out campaigning and... Um, uh, you know, writing and uh, doing his poems, because I, as I said, I see him as a poet. I think he would have been writing and drawing and painting, well, as lovely, well as still a leading artists. testament to him, Julia. Thank you so much. A privilege talking to you on Thank this you very, much on this very special day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is uh, called Give Me Some Truth.
Uh, this is really uh, something very, very different. It's the Ultimate Mixes. It's a collector's album uh, celebrating John Lennon's 80th birthday. And there's a Blu-ray audio disc uh, in there as well, as well as a, a book, 124 pages of it.